Great. Um, well, thank you for joining us today for the Hoffman Ratson Lectureship. Um, the Hoffman Ratson Lectureship was established in 2005 by grateful trainees of Dr. Thomas Hoffman and Kenneth Ratson, who headed the infectious disease training programs at the UM um, Jackson Memorial Site and the Mount Sinai Hospital in Miami Beach, uh, beginning in the 1970s. Dr. Thomas Hoffman received his medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania before completing a fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of Rochester. Dr. Hoffman was chief of ID at the University of Miami from the 1970s to 1998. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Ratson completed his medical degree at Harvard Medical School before residency training at Columbia Presbyterian and ID fellowship at the New England uh, Medical Center. Dr. Ratson was chief of infectious diseases at the Miami VA um, in 1972 before moving to Mount Sinai, where he served as chief of the infectious diseases division until uh, June 2020. Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Ratson's expertise was widely recognized in the community, and they both set high standards for trainees. And I can say as a trainee of Dr. Ratson, it was an extremely high standard <laughs> and, uh, and much appreciated training. Um, this visiting lectureship was established to bring infectious disease leaders from around the country to uh, the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine to honor the tradition of scholarship set by these outstanding leaders. Um, thank you for joining us for this very special Hoffman Ratson lectureship today with a great friend and colleague of our ID division, uh, many of us, Dr. Lisa Metch. Um, Dr. Kaku will now introduce Dr. Metch. Hi, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa, Lisa Metch, who currently serves as the Dean of the General Studies at Columbia University in New York. Dr. Metch is a incredible body of accomplishment. Sorry, can you hear me? I don't know if that's, did I get feedback? You were muted. Let's start again. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Betch, who currently serves as the Dean at the Columbia School of General Studies at Columbia University in New York. Dr. Metch has an incredible body of accomplishments. She completed a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy in History and Sociology. And after this, she completed a Master of Arts in Sociology and went on to complete her PhD at the University of Gainesville in Florida. Dr. Metch then began her faculty appointments at none other than our University of Miami as a research assistant professor in 93. She truly excelled her way to become the division head for the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health here at UM before beginning her career at Columbia University in 2012. Dr. Metch has over 200 publications and is currently an active PI for seven major grants from the Clinical Trials Network and the NIH. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Metch, who will be speaking to us today about the HIV epidemic in the United States. Dr. Metch. Thank you, Dr. Ankaku. Thank you, Dr. Dablecki Lewis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weiss. And thank you to my many, many collaborators um, who are on this call and people that I've learned from so just to start and give you a little bit more detail about me, um, I started in uh, this field in the late 80s as an undergraduate student at Columbia. I had the great honor to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center on one of the first studies of gay men's decisions to get HIV tested. At that time, in the late 1980s, there was every reason not to get HIV tested. Um, if you, there was no treatment, uh, it was a fatal disease, you would often uh, be at, at risk of losing your health insurance, losing your job, and your families turn, turning their backs on you. And this was a multiple layering of uh, stigma with homophobia, discrimination, um, negative views towards people who use drugs. And that's how I, I got started in this field, but it was really my time at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine where I grew up as a researcher, as a person. Um, and there are many people here. I started really with my first grants 
1996, 97, when I was awarded a K award. And it was based on conversations with the then chief of infectious diseases, Gordon Dickinson, Michael Kolber, who was a leading adult HIV, um, when antiretroviral therapy went almost overnight, um, starting at that 1996 International AIDS Conference in Vancouver, where AIDS um, transformed to being, we, we knew at that point that HIV causes AIDS and it went from being a fatal disease to a chronic disease. And over um, my 19 years on the faculty at University of Miami, I got to work with so many amazing people, um, people like Dr. Blecky and Dr. Alcaidio here. They were, they were just starting you know, their careers and now they're, uh, now they're leading in Miami and through the world. Um, Alan Rodriguez is another key collaborator um, who I was so excited um, succeeded me when I left uh, to run the behavioral social sciences implementation science core for the CIFAR. I had the honor of being part of the uh, original group that started the, the uh, developmental CIFAR under the leadership of Dr. Pawa. And um, I, when I moved, um, having been working very closely with the NIDA Clinical Trials Network and seeing um, young, amazing scholars like Hansel Tukes and now David Sirota and so many others, I, I couldn't stay away. So my, my team, um, Lauren Gooden, who directs our center along with Carrigan Parish and others, we were able to start a, a center that we continue to work with our colleagues in Miami. Um, I, it's just working in a place like Miami, which I think many of you know today is, is number one, or is always close to number one in incidence of HIV AIDS in this country, um, has so many structural barriers and so many things um, in some ways stacked against Miami. And it's the doctors, uh, for those of you on the uh, here who are residents and fellows and interns, it's you, the physicians um, in the Department of Medicine that, uh, that are able to uh, help people who have HIV to uh, be fully supported and to uh, live very normal lives. There has been so many advances over, this over the years. Um, as I mentioned, I started my first grant in 1997 when uh, HART at that time, highly active antiretroviral therapy came, came onto the scene. And right away, we knew that people with substance use disorders, people who were marginalized in society, stigmatized, were gonna receive suboptimal care. And that was really the first study that I, I worked on. Back in the day, I remember having many conversations and, and, and sometimes debates with clinicians about, um, could you put somebody who was using drugs on antiretroviral therapy? And these were life decisions. The, the reality at that time was that adherence was a big concern. Um, the medications were not what they are today. There was lots of worries about drug resistance. And, and this was a very, very challenging time. Um, and, and I couldn't be more proud that, that you know, fast forward now 20 years from where we were at, or, or uh, you know, over 20 years, we are now leading the nation and the country with, um, with harm reduction and with a syringe services program back when antiretroviral therapy came onto the scene in places like Miami, there was very, very little support. There was a lot of work that needed to be done with local substance use treatment programs. Back then, substance use treatment was not integrated with other care. And uh, th this was a concern. Uh, this, it, as data came out, once somebody um, was, was clinically um, engaged, they could live any kind of life. And so this was, this was very wrong. And, and we continue to see these negative attitudes and barriers um, within PrEP, within pre-exposure prophylaxis, within hepatitis C and other conditions. So over the years, um, starting with 1996-97, we've had dramatic advances in HIV treatment and prevention. In 2011, there were two major papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. One was the result of the, um, H the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network study that provided uh, the definitive evidence that treating HIV 
HIV, uh, people with HIV, with ARTS, protected partners from infection. The strategy now is undetectable in terms of your viral load, um, means untransmittable. And this, is, this was a major advance. I had, as a social behavioral scientist for, for probably most of the 90s and early 2000s, worked on studies on, on sexual risk behavior, on condom use. Many of these studies were failed studies. It was very, very difficult um, for many reasons for that to be our main prevention strategy. And this, this was really transformative. Similarly, we had another major biomedical advance um, with, with uh, PrEP in, in the main paper in 2011. Today, um, the chief of ID, Dr. Debucky Lewis, leads studies and, and leads really uh, Miami and, and the nation in, in advances and in novel ways to increase uptake of PrEP and to support people in adherence uh, with PrEP. So there were other major things. In 2010, the Affordable Care Act, which opens up nationwide with Medicaid expansion and really provided the foundation for people to um, have access to medication, building, of course, on the Ryan White Care Act and other safety net programs such as ADAP. Um, additionally, what the Affordable Care Act did was, was really um, promoted science. So certain things like HIV testing could be covered by health insurance if it was graded an A or a B by scientists uh, through the U.S. Preventive Task Force, and this was another major at, um, advance. So in 2013, really in 2012, when we had for the first time the uh, International AIDS Conference in the United States in Washington, DC, and that was because we ended the draconian policy of not allowing people with living with HIV to come into this country. Um, we started really talking about the beginning of the end of AIDS with President Obama. Um, even Trump um, and President Trump in, in 2019, uh, we credit, uh, his administration for bringing the ending the HIV AIDS epidemic by the end of the next decade. And I know there are many Miami researchers at University of Miami who are leading the way in these ending the HIV epidemic initiatives. Uh, so again, so much to be um, excited about life expectancy. You find out today that you have HIV and you can expect to live as long as really anybody else. Um, you can have a healthy, normal life. It is nothing like it was in the 80s and 90s. That is, if you are on antiretroviral therapy, which again, you won't, you won't transmit HIV and you're taking your, your medications. And the medications, as, the, as, as you all know, as clinicians, gets better and better every year. Um, and again, uh, you know, this published in, uh, in, in uh, JAMA a couple of years ago um, that, you know, HIV viral load, again, and transmissibility, U equals U. That is the main strategy. And with that, we are talking about normalizing HIV status. So with PrEP and with ART, you know, really there is biomedical treatment, whether you are um, infected with HIV or whether you are at risk for HIV. And so much of the strategies now is talking about ending AIDS, ending the stigma, um, normalizing HIV status. And, uh, you know, in, in, at this point, if you are somebody um, who has a, 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 an immune, uh, issues with your immune system and you are, uh, not wearing a mask and not vaccinated, you know, you're going to be much more at risk for death than you would be if you found out you had HIV and, and then could take medications and your treatment regimens. Um, we have the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which started under President Obama, and the, the latest version uh, for 22 to 25 talks about um, ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S., reducing new infections by 2025. New infections continue to be in the area of 35 to 40,000 per year. Again, very low numbers compared to what we've had recently with, um, with COVID, but completely unacceptable that we should be having new infections with all these advances. We still have 1.2 million people living with HIV, and I, I will talk about the status of how people are doing in a moment. Um, so with these very ambitious targets, with all of these advances, we have seen 
good news with new infections falling um, 8%. But still, again, we even, even now we are over 30,000 new cases of, of this disease. And again, Miami, Florida has the unfortunate distinction of still being um, you know, number one or always very close to number one really for the last decade. Uh, rates of people living with HIV. So this is where we start to see the, uh, the geographic uh, disparities here with the South, you know, darker here is, is, is bad in terms of new, you know, new cases of HIV and the South. And, and again, with Florida, the state of Florida being always number one or number two in new cases of HIV. Um, also, age-adjusted mortality rates, and this is where we start to see the key, key issue of our time. We have all the tools, we, we know what needs to be done, but when it comes to the continuum of care, and particularly engagement in care, things fall off. And we also, in Florida and in Miami, continue to have, a, a, you know, among the highest age-adjusted mortality rates for HIV. Um, so also there are major disparities um, by race, particularly black Latinos, black, um, black people are over eight times more likely than a white person to have a new diagnosis of HIV. And these are in, interestingly and, and unfortunate, while we have seen you know, AIDS diagnoses and particularly in the year 1996, 97, where we saw the dramatic drop in new cases of HIV as well as deaths. I'll show you a slide in a, in a, couple, of, in a, a couple of minutes that shows that those great uh, progress was, was there was major differences but compared to, with black people and white people in this country. Um, HIV related deaths again have fallen and have fallen in half from 2010 to 2017. But again, um, in places like Miami in the South, uh, we continue to see uh, higher death rates than any other places. So here's the United States. So let's now, uh, many of you have seen this slide many, many times, but for those of you who, have, if you haven't seen it, of the 1.2 million people living with HIV in this country, about 13%, one in eight people uh, do not know their status. And that's a very, very important number because it's those people for the most part that are transmitting HIV because they don't know they have it and they're not on antiretroviral therapy, obviously. So they are very, um, very transmissible. Um, in terms of receipt of care, you know, the numbers just go down. And I will say every day this gets better. Just before this meeting, I saw a data that had just come out and the, the percent that are virally suppressed are now going over 60%. So it does get better. But yet, if you sit back and you think one third, at least one third and, and, and closer to one half of people living with HIV do not have this disease in control. And um, it, again, with all the advances that we have, we have to sit back and see how, how can we do better? And I know, again, the physicians there every day are working um, on this and making progress. So there's really a tale of two HIV epidemics. Um, you have those who are engaged in HIV care, virally suppressed. Hopefully, will uh, you know will will we'll die in bed from from something else, live on the beach, living well with HIV. And then you have people who are out of care, who are learning they have HIV late when they've already um, progressed to AIDS. Are people who um, who again have that life expectancy that's back for when I started in this field in the late 80s, 90s. Um, and you know, I put up silence equals death. This was the um, this was the the symbol for ACT UP in the 80s um, when we were fighting homophobia and the government. And I would say for the people that we're working with, this is still very, very appropriate. We cannot continue to be silent. And I say this because some of the people on this on this meeting are doing some of the best work in the country. But as, as I'll speak here today, it's really surprising how few people are focused. A lot more people, a lot of the research is done more with the people living well with HIV as opposed to those who are out of care. So I think there's three really important questions. Who are the out of care? 
where do we find them and what can we do to support them? And I'll just say from the end that we need to do more. Um, we are learning, we are testing new models, but to be where we are in 2022 um, is just is just quite frankly embarrassing and and we need to uh, we need to really, in many ways, I think, rethink a lot of the ways that um, HIV prevention and treatment has been approached. So let me just mention here, who are the people out of care? So I mentioned earlier that Black African-American people with HIV are less engaged in care. Um, if it's estimated that 56, 57 percent of, of the 1.2 million people with HIV are virally suppressed, 51% for Black African Americans. Um, in every aspect of the continuum of care, we see um, we see less progress, and this is is is, is very much uh, in in need of continued work. Um, disparities in age diagnosis. This was the chart that I was referring to earlier. You see, um, in terms of. Uh, AIDS diagnoses, the proportion of, and this is people being diagnosed um, with AIDS. So this will be a late stage diagnose. You see in whites, it's going down and Latinos, it's more or less the same. But for blacks starting in 1995, 97, when we had this progress, we saw those numbers going up. And so something is really wrong with that, that picture. Um, so homeless, um, Housing is so, so key. I, I'm going to show you in a moment a big study that I worked on with many, uh, many colleagues from Miami, and, and it was working as I'm going to speak to hospitalized patients. And I remember Dr. Rodriguez one saying to me, when somebody gets out of the hospital, you know, they need a place to go. They need a place to take a shower. They need to be taken care of. And that is so, so key. So housing, and I know now living in New York City and seeing the differences, this is where you find um, the differences. Um, my, my, my husband, my longtime partner, Ben, who I think is on the call, he works with a large nonprofit agency in New York City called the Fortune Society that spends all their time building new housing um, for people when they get out of prison and jail and making sure that all of their services are taken care of. We have great places in Miami like Camillus and so on, but the amount of housing, and this is one of the areas where I, I noticed such a big difference when I moved from Miami to New York City. Um, so data to care interventions. Um, this has been a big strategy um, I, with health departments all over the country. Can we find people in using surveillance data so that we track people in data um, from when they first uh, first find out they have HIV to make sure they're engaged in care, having data sets talk to other data sets. My dear colleague, Dan Feaster, um, who, who has worked on so many things, I know this is a very, very big interest of his. And one of the things, there, had, there was a cluster uh, randomized evaluation study um, that, that actually did not show to work in trying to increase engagement. But one of the things that has come out of these data to care approaches is where do we find the people that are half the people that have, uh, have, uh, have their, um, their HIV control. If somebody has their, uh, you can lose somebody. Um, anyway, that it would be the jails, the emergency departments, and the hospital. So let me just say a moment for the jails. One of the big um, risks is often when people go to jails and prisons, they will get on antiretroviral therapy, they will get treatment, but then when they are released from, um, from prison or jail, that's when things often fall off. There's not, because again, there's inadequate housing, there's inadequate support. Um, people who had um, possibly, you know, had, um, had substance use disorders will return to that, that interferes with their care. And I did wanna show one study that's one of my favorite studies that was uh, published by, a, by a, a HIV infectious disease physician who passed away, Billy Cunningham. He was at UCLA and he did this really great study with a peer navigation intervention um, that, that supported people when they got out of the jails to, to make sure that they stayed virally suppressed. This was with uh, men with HIV and trans women, um, and it was an excellent study, and one that I think uh, there may be people uh, in Miami who would 
want to replicate a study like this. Um, so I, I want to take a moment for the hospital work that I've done and recognize somebody very, very special. Um, I would say the majority here because most, uh, I think many of residents are new do not know her, but for those who do, um, she was a member of the of Division of Infectious Diseases, Dr. Toy Brewer. And I have to say, um, there's so many people on this call that I that have inspired me and I've learned from. Um, Toy was the first clinician when, when I was working who, who used to come and she would be so happy when she was going to outpatient care. When she had inpatient wards, um, she was uh, very, very depressed. And she would always say, she was really the one who pointed to me as a social scientist to say, you know, that there's this, this really two, two groups of people and they are so different and we need to do more work in the hospital. And um, as I'll, I'll show later, there's very few researchers um, in, in, in the US that are, and clinicians that are really focusing on intervening and Toy, Toy was one of them. And for those of you who knew her, um, we should always remember the great work. Um, in many ways, Hansel and David Sirota here. She was the, she was, she was like the person who, who kind of, uh, I think, would inspire a lot of the work that you do today. So I, I did want to just take a moment to uh, to recognize her. She worked at the Miami Dade County Health Department. She worked for the CDC. She worked when ID used to have a clinic down in uh, South Dade, and and she did did great work. So uh, working with Toy and Alan Rodriguez, and um, we work very closely with Carlos Del Rio and uh, his team at Emory, we studied early on hospitalized um, patients with HIV. And one of the things we looked at is, is that we found about one fifth had never had an HIV care provider. Um, very, uh, you know, less than half for sure were, were taking art. And we also learned back in the studies we did that 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 at least about one third were, were self-reporting having unprotected sex with an HIV negative or unknown status partner, which again is critical for this group because again, they don't benefit from treatment as prevention. So, and we found there, and this was, this was a study done at Jackson Memorial Hospital and Grady Memorial Hospital that um, people who use crack cocaine were more likely to never have a provider, not be on art, continuing to engage in unprotected sex. Also, if you were living on the street and, the, and, and it really started to highlight the hospital as a critical place to do, um, to do prevention work, to do engagement in care work. And again, you know, fast forwarding to today, if we're going to look to find um, a way to really end the epidemic, even if we ever get to the, the goals of 90, 90, 90, we're still going to have people that present in the hospital that clinically present as if they did um, before, um, before before all the biomedical advances, including highly active antiretroviral therapy. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez you'll, and Dr. Colby, you'll remember this paper that we did with our dear colleague, uh, Dr. St. Saint John. Um, and, and this was looking at differences in HIV-related hospitalizations between Haitian-born um, Blacks and U.S.-born Blacks. And we found that, again, unfortunately, Haitians is an, you know, and we know, and I know you all know this very well and work with people, um, you know, we're, we're, we're um, being uh, diagnosed later in the hospital um, with lower CD4 counts and was, a, and, and I know Dr. Rodriguez had a HRSA study that had worked on this as well. So all of these studies and, and, and other work really point to the hospital, um, the inpatient setting as a really important understudied and overlooked, and I would still argue that still holds today, to implement linkage to care interventions. Um, years ago, and this is not a nice thing to say, people used to report, refer to people as frequent flyers, but it was people who were readmitted you know, more and more to the hospital. Um, hospitals can provide a teachable moment. And then we know that most inpatients are passively linked. And, and I know there's been a lot, a lot of work um, on this over the years. I remember being in meetings with Dr. Colbert, where he was, or with Dr. Rodriguez, where he was organizing people across the Jackson system and UM to uh, try to address this. So cost considerations, and this might be a little bit off in my, my uh, 
clinician uh, colleagues will correct it, but you know, I always use this slide that the cost of a year of art therapy was around 10 to 15,000 and the cost of an average hospital stay for a person living with HIV might be 15,000. That, that may be changing, but it's, it's more or less around, I would say, still the same cost. I, I show these slides because this slide particularly because this is back in 1983. So at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, before we knew that HIV caused AIDS, and when um, we had this unknown disease that started as gay cancer, gay plague, you know, the, the the hospital wards became so you know well known. This is where this is where we saw you know you see any any movie from back from and the band played on to you know, how to survive a plague or anything going back to where we lost the generations of people, it was in the hospital. Um, today, we know that hospital admissions have, have declined incredibly. Um, my, my colleague, Hansel Tooks, who shared with me, you know, he was on the, um, he was on inpatient service the last two weeks. And there's, I think now it is, um, it is, there is one, there was one, um, one group, and I forgot, Hansel, it's called, uh, what is the group called? I don't know if you can come off mute. Team One. Team One. Team so, one. We, so Alan will know, and, and others, when we did this work, we did, there were three teams, so right? So we went from three teams to one team. So it obviously shows the progress. However, even the, the patients seen by Team One um, really haven't changed you know, much. They are patients, I've heard clinicians say, on way to early death, they are presenting um, clinically like they did again in the 1980s. Um, the co incredible comorbidities, many readmissions, um, incredible social disadvantage, and um, and and really, you know, in some ways could be considered by by you know larger society turning their backs on, on such people. And these are people, but we know with all the advances in, in HIV, with immune reconstitution, with all that, that, that this can be turned around for most people. I mean, there are people who come in with, you know, with, with uh, severe, you know, metastasized cancer and others that, that, that might not be possible, but for many, the things can still be turned around. And, you know, as I mentioned already, I mean, hospital, Rates have have continued to go down. These are just some of the um, some of the major articles that show um, you know the the decrease in hospitalization rates. But we also continue to see more HIV comorbidities that are going up. More than seventy percent of of people with HIV that are in the hospital versus you know fifty six percent of of people who not have HIV have comorbidities on. And again, um, hospitalized people living with HIV experience higher risk for chronic conditions. Uh, again, there's another issue, and this is an issue in general in the hospital, but it's higher for people living with HIV, which is leaving against medical advice. And this is another area that has been looked at. Um, hospital readmissions and HIV, you know, again, um, mo most readmissions are preventable. They're commonly attributed. This is an art, a study by um, our colleague at uh, Parkland in Dallas who works, and she worked with us on some of our work that really looked at most readmissions could be preventable. Um, so I want to just spend um, a, a couple of minutes talking to you about a big study that we did a couple of years ago, um, which was called CTN0049. My colleagues, many of them here, and it was mentioned that I work in the NIDA Clinical Trials Network, where you can do very large studies. And we did this study, Jackson Memorial Hospital was one of 11 hospitals in this study where we randomized and we, we invited to participate um, patients in the hospital who had, um, who had a, a detectable viral load, most people did if we were able to get that information, uncontrolled HIV infection that, uh, that were either indicated or self-reported having heavy alcohol use, cocaine use, um, opioid use, and we um, looked to try to intervene with them. In the hospital, and we had we t it was a three arm randomized controlled trial. Two of the arms got patient navigation. So what we were trying to do is meet them at bedside, work with them 
for up to six months on trying to support in every which way we could getting them engaged in care. And that meant, you know, um, basically recognizing their strengths, overcoming barriers. And then in the other, so, and then one arm was treatment as usual. And then the most enhanced arm, we gave people financial incentives. And this is a very um, widely used evidence-based um, intervention for people who use drugs. It's used in many other areas and smoking cessation and many other behaviors where you use um, financial incentives as a way of um, using an escalating scale of, of certain things that people could um, earn in terms of uh, then, then carrying out on a particular behavior. In this intervention and, and in this study where we had, um, the, these were all people who use drugs, the majority were stimulant users using cocaine or meth where we didn't have at the time, and there still is very little um, biomedical treatment, contingency management or financial incentives is really the best, um, the best uh, evidence-based strategy that, that there was. So we use this, we paid people up to $1,160. And you can see on this slide, all the different things that they would get paid for to do. Um, when we started the study, we, heard from a lot of clinicians and a lot of um, collaborators that, you know, if this is shown to work, are you, do you think that a, a place like Jackson would be able to do this study and, and, and do this intervention? And we said, we want, this is again, the evidence base, we want to do it, but they, we're going to do it in a limited way for six months. And then with the hope that people with the primary outcome being viral suppression, that this, that, that, this intervention would help people be virally suppressed and then the system would take over. Um, so this was the design, as you can see, you know, three people in the three arms. Um, we were able to have very high follow-up rates in the study, uh, almost following everybody at six months, which was the post-intervention play, but the primary outcome was at 12 months, six months after the intervention ended. Um, just in terms of the baseline characteristics, you can see it was mostly um, black participants, one third female, um, very you know high viral loads, low CD4 counts, and, and incredible socioeconomic factors of, of having been incarcerated, unstably housed, food insecure, psychologically distressed. Um, just the intervention uptake was very high. And just one piece to note is that the median incentives that people earned in this study were $722, which again, considering this was a very poor uh, group of participants, it's a lot of money. And 87%, um, one of the things we also incentivized was having a drug or alcohol-free specimen. So here's the bottom line of the results. Um, at six months, we did see a, a uh, a significant difference with 46% of the people in the purple is that most enhanced group um, being virally suppressed compared to 34%. And in the, uh, we drew blood. So this was a hardcore biologic outcome, but at 12 months, you do not see any difference. So basically at the end of the time they had the intervention, it worked, at 12 months, it did not. Um, I just want to point out very quickly that in these 11 sites, we had four sites in the South, um, also in Atlanta, in, um, in Baltimore, and in Dallas, Texas, and those were, and excuse me, we also had a site in Birmingham, Alabama. It was those four sites in the South that had the lowest viral suppression rates. So again, pointing to what we saw before. So we had success in the short term, but overall a negative trial. Um, and I do wanna say that there was a, a follow-up paper uh, done by Charlene Trainer, who, who received her PhD in epidemiology and public health sciences at University of Miami. And she showed that self-efficacy working with uh, Dan Feaster, who was her, her major advisor, we showed that the intervention was successful in increasing self-efficacy. And for those people that had increased self-efficacy, it was a really important factor. So how we set up this trial was the right way from the beginning. 
Um, I just want to show you also that we had very low rates of substance use disorder treatment um, throughout. We did have a difference in the six month, um, the six month assessment again showing more people in that patient navigation and contingency management arm. But this also speaks very much to the importance of, of integrating substance use treatment into the hospital setting. Um, and again, high rates of having a positive drug specimen at follow-up. Um, a, a new uh, analysis that we did for today um, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Yu Pan in Public Health Sciences, that we showed, you know, this is at baseline, and this does show that we had, this is the number of, uh, the mean number of sexual risk behaviors in the past 90 days. And I show this to you also to see that, you know, um, the, the, the population, the participants in this are continuing to engage in, in higher sexual risk behaviors. Um, I say this very carefully because I, I, I learned very much over the years, it's not anything about blaming participants or, you know, we recognize these are very vulnerable, marginalized participants, um, but this is of concern. So I, I want to highlight just other work in this area, and there's really very little, um, particularly with people with HIV in the hospital setting. Um, my colleague and, and Alan Rodriguez has worked with him too, Dr. Tom Giordano at Baylor College of Medicine, an ID physician there, did a similar study at the same time. It wasn't with people who use drugs, but it was in their safety net hospital and tested a two-session peer mentoring um, intervention to re-engage people after hospitalization and also found, a, a, interesting, almost, almost identical, um, in, if you look at that 46% of, of being uh, vir virally suppressed in their mentor group versus their control, but did not find a significance. He, he has a new study that's looking at coping um, in the hospital setting and is testing that now. When I did a search on NIH, it was really, at least within HIV, really uh, quite stunning that there are really no other studies that are focusing on this group in HIV. Um, so how else can we intervene? I just wanna take a moment to recognize some really exciting work that I, that I was able to work with um, a really brilliant sociologist at Columbia University, Marilena Lakis, who's now at um, NYU. And uh, she, she we, working with her, we apply the theory of habitus. So the idea here is that when you're looking at a patient sitting in the, ho in the hospital bed, that person has had a lifetime of discrimination sometimes, a lifetime of working with institutions, possibly being in homeless shelters, possibly being um, in, in uh, having distrust with their doctors, with their families. And as, so they, so working through and what life opportunities people have had and what there's, there's concepts of agency and structure in sociology. And as those come together and people have tried to get into systems, they have had um, experiences which has then guided their, um, their, their uh, outcomes. And this is an example, we did over a hundred qualitative interviews at Columbia uh, Presbyterian Hospital to try to um, understand people who are not engaged and these same patients living with HIV who are in the hospital setting. And this is one quote from this study that a 41 year old African-American male described wanting to be treated like a person. You know, he indicated that his continuation in HIV care was contingent upon his relationship with his provider. His provider was everything. And he says, you know, the nurses in there, they acted like, I, I want to be treated like a person. I know what I got. You know, he said, you know, I grew up with, with no family, stuff like that. So it's easy to hurt my feelings. And again, I think sometimes all of us as researchers, clinicians, you know, we're, we're seeing what's in the present. And just as you take a medical history of a, of, a, of a patient and you find, and you do take, of course, social histories too, but we don't always get to delve into the experiences that people have had um, in their lifetimes. And, and that is so key here. And I think going forward, it's how can we build on that that experience. Habitus, I know, is a clinical term. It's usually not meant what, the way I'm talking about it, but I think it's a really important um, 
important concept. Uh, another thing, this is a in definition of a good doctor, a 40 year old African American woman said, you know, somebody I could somebody I could talk to about my problems, nobody shoving me away, I could just be me. You know, um, Hansel shared with me when he was in the hospital the last two weeks, he sang happy birthday to somebody. It was so exciting. It was a person's birthday. And it's like those kinds of things that make all the difference. Um, a 42 year old male who had spent more than half of his life incarcerated. You know, he says, when you get a conviction, he says for a felony, you know, you didn't hurt anybody and you find a job, get family, you know. So as soon as they find that I have a felony, they don't want to give me a job. They put me in a situation and, you know, and, 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 and we know from the studies we've done, many people um, that have lived um, marginalized lives, you know, may have, um, have experienced being in prisons and jails and being, it's just another stigmatizing issue. It's this intersectionality, which is so important when we look at uh, the people we see. And I think these are the kinds of things in the future interventions. Um, this was a study we also, uh, an analysis from, um, from the CTN 49 where we start, where we looked at people who were started in the hospital on antiretroviral therapy. My understanding now is most people at Jackson are, I'm not positive about that, but we show that um, people who were started in the hospital, and this was in our study, so if they were in the intervention arm, it made a difference with linkage to care, but also starting in the hospital made you more likely to, um, to continue. Um, so integrated care and treatment, I've referred to this a number of times, and this is so key and also so exciting. Um, particularly, I have the honor to work with uh, David Sirota now, and he's leading some really great work in this. Um, some of you are probably familiar with his very exciting clinical service that's been created with Jackson Memorial uh, that, that works with people with severe infections and that come in, um, again, substance use infections, things like bacteria endocarditis and it's a one it's an and again it's in the hospital setting it's an opportunity to not only treat the infection but to treat substance use to meet people with a harm reduction approach and he's gotten he, he just published a paper um in that has shown um really important uh pilot data and now uh, Dr. Sirota, or everyone seems to call him just Sirota, um, is, uh, is, is, is leading um, with us a CTN 121 study that's going to take his great pilot work and test it nationally. And these are just some of the components. It really is recognizing that the I, it's, it's really testing an integrated I, infectious disease team approach that starts in the hospital, goes to post-hospital care and works to post-infection linkage and, and has, you know, in components, again, grounded in harm reduction and, pain, and patient-centered approach. And I mentioned this you know, although this talk is on HIV, certainly HIV, people with HIV are part of this work, um, but it's also a model, I think, for care going forward. Um, so I, I also want to mention, just while I'm on the topic of some really innovative work, this was a really important um, study and it, and it um, advanced for, for Miami-Dade County, uh, led by Dr. Alan Rodriguez with Dr. Colbert and others um, that that essentially tries, it's, it's the same kind of integrated care, it tries to meet people right when they find out they have their diagnosis of HIV and get them rapidly uh, integrated into care. Um, and I want to also say, just as we think about other approaches, you know, just this week, I believe, you know, Viv Healthcare announced um, FDA approval for long-acting ART. We know we have long-acting PrEP. Um, and then also, again, I want to mention the great work that uh, Dr. DeBlecky Lewis is doing with PrEP and with the clinic there. Um, long-acting ART, you know, what was different here than what had been um, building on the research is now this would be taking long acting um, art every eight weeks, the injection. There is still, I think, we're still, I think, a long ways away from doing this in the hospital because you have to be virally suppressed before you do this. And there's a lot to think about, but these are uh, future things to think. Um, I have a colleague at Columbia, Morgan Philbin, who's working with uh, Maria Alcaide and Margaret Fischel on um, 
on a, a pilot study to look at shared decision making with clinicians and, and patients. And they're going to be doing this pilot work in Miami um, that's going to look at uh, with women living with HIV. Then I want to just present a very, very innovative, and, and so much that I've said today points to this. I want to make a statement that, to my knowledge, and I've been working in substance use and HIV, going back to my K award, I do not know an efficacious intervention, it's unbelievable to say this, and Hans will correct me if I'm wrong, that links people who use drugs with HIV to HIV care. I, and I say this, some of you, uh, Michael Culver and others will re remember the artist study that I did with Carlos Del Rio back in the early 2000s, and it worked very successfully except for people with drugs. So teleharm reduction, which is Hansel's new Avenir Award, I think provides a huge opportunity to test a very novel intervention. Again, meeting people where they're at and building on the lessons that we've learned in, in COVID. And I think it's, it's really critical. Um, and, it, and it's very consistent. Nora Volkel, um, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, published a paper a few weeks ago in Health Affairs that really said making addiction treatment more realistic and pragmatic, the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. That, you know, I think, you know, I think about that for stimulant use, particularly, like we need better interventions and they may not be perfect. I mean, the vaccines for COVID are not perfect, but look at those amazing advances. And I think, you know, I think, um, what Hansel and, and David and others are doing are really moving beyond this moralistic view of drug use and abstinence and judgmental attitudes, and it's key. So if we are gonna end the HIV epidemic in the US, I just put a couple of things. You all know this better than I do. One is social forces. I didn't mention politics and mass incarceration and racism and homophobia and all of these things that continue and often are harder for us as researchers to change. But I think you know through the work we do in systems and structures, um, in novel approaches, harm reduction, compassion, respect, integrated care, addressing social determinants of health, housing, food insecurity, transportation, addressing stigma. Stigma is a common thread in every study that I've ever done and that I think you know, we see playing out every day. I think the concept of habitus that um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lakis has, has been really working on as a sociologist and always taking into consideration race, gender, and class. And then intervening in the hospital setting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy that uh, when I look up an NIH reporter and, and you know, I, I was delighted to see my colleague Tom Giordano has a new study, but there's very, very few people um, doing this work. So many thanks to the collaborators who gave input to today's talk. Several of them, actually most of them are from University of Miami. Um, and I just want to put a slide. I'm sure I don't have everybody's picture here. I don't have your picture, Dr. Weiss, here. But um, I, have, I have lots of um, people that I worked with over the years in Miami. Some are younger when these pictures were taken. Um, some are people who passed away. Um, a, a dear colleague, Yves Jante. I look at Henry Boza. Some of you remember Henry was a... Um, a wonderful collaborator. And there's so many. Um, my hat's off to University of Miami for the amazing work. I, I, think, um, I think it's Miami who's going to end the epidemic, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenich. That was a, a real beautiful review that was insightful and, to me, inspiring because you really brought to, the, uh, to everybody's uh, uh, the, the forefront to our minds about the importance of being a physician and how we care for these patients and the interplay that society has. Let me ask you to, uh, a question uh, that relates to, and sort of looking at the future and the trajectory. Let's say we were able to get a vaccine for HIV to prevent HIV. Given what we've already learned about the acceptance of such treatments in um, marginalized communities, and knowing what we've learned about the COVID vaccine, what could we learn and do differently to improve uh, vaccine acceptance when ultimately such a vaccine, I think, will come, come to pass? 
Yeah, thank you for asking this. And I know that NIH is starting to fund um, this issue right now. They, there was a lot of this research done earlier um, in maybe the 90s, 2000s. So it's a key issue. I, I think what we learned, I would point to actually the work going on in your department. I mean, I think what we need to do is do more of harm reduction kind of approaches, meeting people where we're at. I think we could learn a lot more even in COVID, you know, in, in some of that. And I think that work has been done. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to uh, local communities. I think it's going to the churches. Um, I think it's going in, in, in other religious organizations. It's going locally in the community. And I, I you know, being so close to Miami, I, I've seen, I, Kanzel, I've seen you do that, you know, and go and, and speak about the COVID vaccine when there's, um, when there's was a lot of distrust. I mean, I think, I think, you know, Dr. Weiss, I, this, this theory of habitus that my colleague, Dr. Lakis does, I think that's what we need to understand more is I think we need to understand more the, the histories, you know, we still speak of Tuskegee, we speak about, you know, so many of these, of these things. I mean, there is some parts with COVID that, you know, just, I, I can't even explain some of, the, some of the resistance that we see in some parts of this country. And I think it's, it's caught up in the politics of the time. It's caught up in this anti-government distrust that we have a lot of work to do to, to get that right. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Dubleki Lewis, would you like to make a comment or Dr. Colber? Sure, that was an amazing talk, Lisa. Thank you so much. You brought us through so many years of incredible work, and uh, that you've that you've you've led, and um, it was amazing to see that. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, you know, your thoughts about as we move into the realm, the era of long-acting uh, medication, both for treatment and prevention of HIV, also for treatment of substance use disorder. Um, you know, what, what, do, what do you think we need to keep an eye on to make sure that those innovations kind of decrease disparities instead of uh, yeah. the opposite? Yeah, I, I, I think your endpoint is, is a real concern. And, you know, I, I, the, the CTM 49 talk, some of you may remember, I gave a talk at Croy a couple of years ago and somebody raised their hand. I think it was uh, maybe Joe Aaron or someone raised their hand and said, you know, long acting art, that's the, that's the answer. And I wouldn't say that, you know, um, Hansel knows he worked on a study with, uh, I think the paper's coming out in addiction with Todd Corthius, right, of extended naltrexone. Um, and and it, it wasn't so successful, you know, the study. Actually, the study had to be stopped because, you know, it was trying to, um, trying to, you know, have people who in some ways didn't want to stop drugs. I, I mean, and Hansel can speak better, you know, than I can, who are not, not ready. So I don't think this is the magic bullet. I, I really am excited about the work that Morgan Philbin is doing with Maria Alkaidi um, and others with, with, with the University of Miami that's going to develop a shared decision-making tool. I think like that's the way, you know, we need to go. And, and, and Dr. Dablecki Lewis, you know best with PrEP how uptake, you know, I think we can learn a lot of lessons from PrEP and, and where we are with PrEP today and why we didn't see the uptake, you know, that we did and hopefully build on that. And I know um, Morgan and, and Maria and others on that team are, are definitely looking to do that. Well, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Rosenmetsch. It was sort of like homecoming day for uh, everybody, <laughs> yeah. I think, in the HIV world in Miami, having you present. And we wel welcome you to come in person uh, as soon as you possibly can. And I thank everybody for participating in the sponsors for today's Grand Rounds. Please don't forget to look in the chat for the link uh, to receive MOC and CME credit. And I hope wish everybody a safe day and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank all you. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to uh, all my friends there. Okay, bye-bye.